for those who are new to us. ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism with moral force. Today, ProPublica reporter Anjanette Damon will moderate this discussion with key local stakeholders from the Reno community. And all of you also have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of that panel conversation. So keep thinking about those questions as we're running through the session. I wanna thank the folks at the downtown Reno Library for allowing us to use this beautiful space. What an incredible space it is. <laughs> And for assisting with coordination on top of that, we have their tech folks here helping us out throughout the day and have been complete lifesavers. So thank you all so much for that as well. I'd also like to thank McKinsey and Company for their support of today's event. This event is being held in partnership with Nevada Humanities and the Reno Gazette Journal, who have both been incredible partners in pulling everything together today. If you aren't already familiar with them, I definitely encourage you to check them out. We do have folks here from Nevada Humanities um, who you can ask any questions of after the session, so feel free to pull them aside. If our Nevada Humanities folks actually want to raise their hand so everyone knows who you are, awesome. They do some incredible work here. Um, so feel free to, again, pull them aside and ask them some questions. <laughs> Before in officially introducing our moderator, I'd like to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and live streamed. Um, if you registered online, you will receive a recording of the event via email. It will also be available on ProPublica's YouTube channel. If you didn't sign in online, no worries. As long as you checked in at the front of the room, we will send a recording of that email to the email that you listed. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce to Reno uh, local and today's moderator, Anjanette Damon. <laughs> yeah, <please. Hi. laughs> Anjanette is a reporter at ProPublica who focuses on government accountability. And prior to joining ProPublica, she worked at the Reno Gazette Journal and the USA Today Network. I know that she is familiar with many of you here. Um, and vice versa. So we're excited to hear from everyone on the panel today. Um, I hope you all enjoy the session. Again, I'm really looking forward to your questions at the end of the panel. Be thinking about those. I'll be walking around with a mic after the panel um, to take your questions. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Anjanette from here. Go ahead, Anjanette. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming today. It's really great to see all your faces on a Saturday morning. And a special thank you to our panelists um, who are also giving up part of their, their weekend in the month of December, right before the holidays, to uh, join us for this really important conversation. You know, I, don't, I think it's fair to say that pretty much every individual in this community has felt the impact of the city's housing shortage in some way. Homes are more difficult and more expensive to get are becoming increasingly difficult to hang on to for those who have had stable housing even for, for years in this community. Five years ago, the average rent was $1,000 a month. Um, today, it is more than $1,600 a month. Um, the median house price was under $300,000. Today, it's well over $500,000. And we're meant to afford this on a, a median income of under 60 grand a year. Um, but the situation is increasingly dire for our neighbors who make the least amount of income and are struggling to support themselves and stay housed. Um, the suffering caused by this housing shortage is pretty stark. Uh, just a few facts to kind of put that into context. Reno's extremely low income renters face a shortfall of more than 11,000 units in this city. The Reno Housing Authority's waiting lists are so long that they are regularly closed off to new applicants um, for, uh, for subsidized housing. In each of the last three years, the city's unsheltered population has hit a new record high. And while there has been an increase in capacity and shelter capacity, um, those, those new shelter campuses are almost always full. Um, meanwhile, the housing relied upon by the poorest in our community um, in, in many cases is being demolished or remodeled or purchased by another landlord um, and people are really struggling to, to stay, on, stay in the houses that they actually have. Um, so what can we do to help? Um, we've assembled this panel uh, this morning to help answer exactly that question. Um, so this conversation, um, our panelists are here to help us, one, better define the problem of affordable housing in this community, 
describe the existing barriers to affordable housing and to help us identify potential solutions and how the community can, can involve themselves in, in those solutions. So let me, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Um, first we have Dane Hilliard. Um, he is the co-founder of Green Street Development Corporation, the largest developer of affordable housing in Northern Nevada. He has 30 years of experience in building and financing affordable housing, including building over 2,000 affordable apartment units in Washoe County. And just as an aside, when I was starting at the Reno Gazette Journal as a baby reporter, I wrote for the business section and I wrote about construction and development and housing. And this guy would always return my phone calls, which was <laughs> really nice for a 22-year-old reporter. Uh, we have Christine Hess. Uh, she serves as the executive director for the Nevada Housing Coalition. The Nevada Housing Co Coalition is a statewide member-based nonprofit working to promote and advance affordable housing for all Nevadans through education, advocacy, and collaboration. And we have council member Devin Reese. He is the at-large Reno City Council member, so he represents the entire city. Uh, he is also a local attorney and primarily practices civil litigation with the statewide law firm of Hutchison and Stephan. Devin is proud to represent labor unions, small government entities, businesses, and families. And Wendy Wigglesworth, thank you so much for being here. She is RISE's outreach director. She brings firsthand knowledge from the community to RISE by building relationships within our community of unhoused neighbors. If you don't know, RISE runs the women's shelter. Um, Wendy holds a support group for transition called Inside Just to help guests have support in their transition into stability. She is also a facilitator at A Window Between Worlds, art transforming trauma-based workshops on Our Place campus. <laughs> And Garrett Gordon, um, thank you so much for being here. He is a partner with Lewis and Roca and has practiced land use and real estate law here in Reno for the past 15 years. He represents Jacobs Entertainment, the company developing Reno's Neon Line District. He was born and raised in Reno, and in addition to his law degree, he has a bachelor's in urban planning. So thank you very much. And you'll see we have one empty chair here. We have one panelist who will be joining us, um, Lilith Baran um, with the ACLU. She is a, a well-known housing activist in the community. Unfortunately, she had a flight canceled last night, so she is madly dashing to try and, and make it here on time. So um, we look forward when she gets here. Hopefully that chair will be, will be filled. Um, so, okay, we will dive right into um, the start of our program here. Um, and Wendy, I'd like to start with you, if, if I could. Okay. Um, as someone, you've experienced being unhoused yourself. You are out um, in the camps almost daily, um, working with, with people um, as they transition either from being unsheltered into housing. Can you, can you describe the housing problem in Reno as you experience it? Um, well, I could do that a few different ways. Like, in general, in town, it's, it's, it's a, a crisis that I think has gotten, like, not addressed for way too long. Um, when you're outside trying to get a house, it's, it's really hard to get a house because there's nothing available. There's a lot of people that live outside that work and even doubling up you know, with your friend, you, they still can't afford it. And then when they can, it's a matter of if, if it's available, if you have like a companion animal or if they see the Record Street address on there. I don't want to say it, but I know a lot of landlords will look at that and it will affect their personal opinion of putting you through. Mm. Which is, and it's just, that's just hu human, human stuff. But, um, from over here, it's, it also, let me see, I wrote, I wrote down something proper. Um, <laughs> stop laughing at me. Okay, quit it, I'm not even gonna tell you again, I'm just joking. Okay, as an overlooked community crisis that needed attention as our population grew, from over here, it seems like solutions are glanced at, then passed on. So many units are now gone, nothing to replace these homes or the homeless rates as, as they continue to grow and available being too few and too expensive compared to the wages paid. And we've grown as a town, but the places to call home hasn't. 
Yes, no, I think that's exactly right. Even when there might be opportunities available, there's different barriers that stand in between individuals. And well, like I, I still live in a motel because I can't find anything and I'm recently getting callbacks. Okay, hey, your, your wait list is up, but oh, your, your, med your income is, is over the low medium that we're requiring. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what's such, it's, a, it's frustrating because I don't, I mean, I don't want to make more to get more. I don't know. I, I just. It's, I think if you feel comfortable with this, I think some people have an image of, in their mind of what it is like to live in a motel in Reno. Um, would you mind describing any of your experience living in a motel? Um, well, it's, it's, it's a motel, so you, you have to understand there's people that come in and go 24 hours because it's Reno and it's a drive through town. But it's just like, it, like when you live in a studio apartment, it's the same thing, it's the same community. It's just like an apartment complex, but they're not all kitchenettes and they all don't have ovens and refrigerators and bathtubs, but it's still an apartment complex that's just called a motel. Mm -hmm. You know, because some of the motels do the weekly and monthly and I, I, you know, I think they're great for first option up when you're moving out of your parents' house and the last option, but also the re-entry, like that's where I moved in when I was outside the out, and now there's, they're not there, so they're that, like, you know, let me get away from my mom and move out real quick. Option of 135 a week, you know, 20 years ago, isn't isn't even an option anymore. Right. And yeah, does that make sense? It does. Thank so you. so it's just it's just like a normal place. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, Dane, we hear the term affordable housing a lot. Can you talk to us about what what does that actually mean? How is that defined? Sure. Um, the federal government basically defines it this way. Uh, it based it off the area of median income and the number of people in the household. Um, so a low income is considered someone that makes 60% or less of the area of median income. And then the rent is based on that. Very low income is 50% or less of the median. Oh, is, it, is my mic not in the right spot? It's a little bit off. A little bit off. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, low income is considered people that make 60% of the area of median income. Very low income is people that make 50% or less. And extremely low income is people that make 30% or less. So that's how it's defined at the federal level. And that's how we define it here when we do tax credit projects. And so we're talking in that case specifically about subsidized housing. This is tax credit housing, which is what we do. Um, and so it's considered affordable housing, low income housing. Yeah. So. Christine, can you talk a little bit about that we have, there's, there's different types of housing that winds up being affordable, right? So, you know, we have developers that come in and, and um, take advantage of the tax credits and different assistance in order to build subsidized housing. Lily is here, please come to us. <laughs> Got this, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's a microphone for you. So yeah, you can put that or you can hold it, whatever you feel, whatever you feel comfortable with. But yeah, let me um, let me read Lily's uh, bio real quick. I know I kind of described what she does, but um, Lily joined the ACLU of Nevada to continue her fight for freedom and restorative justice. Through the years, she has combined activism, research, and artistry to better the community in creative ways. And the issues she is most passionate about are criminal legal reform, housing rights, and education. So thank you for braving all those airports. Thank you. <laughs> And, and so, Christine, back to um, this question about kind of the universe of what is affordable housing, whether it's, whether it's subsidized, whether it's motels, whether it's um, you know, naturally occurring units that are in the community. Um, can you give us just you know, kind of a, a, an overview, overview of the current state of affordable housing? And, and, you know? Sure. So first, I also want to kind of expand on the definition of affordable housing. So as Dane described, we're often talking, when we talk about affordable housing, it's super complex, it's particularly affordable housing that has income restrictions associated with it to make it actually affordable. And the reason those units exist is because as an industry, as a sector, the government, we would consider housing unaffordable when you pay 30% or more of your income on rent. And those numbers are actually staggering with the number of people, particularly 
that are, as Dane mentioned, either very low income or extremely low income individuals, and it holds true in Reno, but across the state, uh, the number of people that pay more than 30% of their uh, income on housing costs. And then if you stretch that even further, more than 50%. When a household is paying more than 50%, they become very high risk of homelessness. You know, really one medical emergency away, uh, a car breaking down, that, that they lose their housing. So they're very housing insecure. Uh, so we definitely lack the amount of affordable housing. I did, and I see one of my partners here in the audience. Um, for kind of the current state of affordable housing in Reno, I wanted to kind of talk about also how many units we have. And so again, when I talk about affordable housing, I'm going to talk about those units that have income restrictions. Right, so certainly we can talk about increasing inventory overall and how that may impact pricing for houses to become more affordable. But again, talking about the income levels of those, especially in the very low or extremely low income, that's still a different conversation. So when I talk about units that have restrictions, um, I leaned on my partners at the Nevada Housing Division because I collaborate uh, for sure and we're lucky to have an awesome state entity um, helping us with affordable housing. The team is fantastic. So I leaned on them and said, hey, what is our current state? That and I also did some reading. All of you could do some reading too, by the way. These reports are right <laughs> up on the Housing Division site. So the city of Reno has 6,500 units um, at the end of 2019 that are income restricted, right, tax credit units. And I got that from the 2020 Annual Housing Progress Report. Um, per the Nevada Housing Division, we have 385 units of new construction. So brand new developments going up, 385 units, and 610 units that are being rehabbed. So um, units that are already affordable the good news is they're staying affordable and being rehabbed. And these projects are, were approved at the Board of Finance. Additionally, Reno has, at least in the pipeline, and I know Dane could say that there's even more, right? but this is what the housing division knows and shared with me, an additional 457 units of new construction. So in the pipeline. I kind of just want to translate that if we think about 2.3 individuals per household. So that's a unit in the tax credit. I know that's really complex and we don't have to go into detail, but it's our number one production tool and preservation tool to build affordable housing. We have 842 units of new construction, either already approved or in the pipeline that the housing division knows of. Dane could probably enlighten us to a few more. That's almost 2,000 more low-income households in Reno that will be supported. So coming up. That's helpful. <laughs> um, it's far from the 11,000 units we need that you referenced, Anjanette, uh, and it's far from serving our need. But just wanted to kind of set that stage if, if that's Yeah, thank then. you. That is very, that's very helpful. And I, I think we're going to get into this conversation a little bit more, but just as um, Dana and I were talking before this started, uh, just the, the approval process that affordable home cons builders have to go through um, can take more than a year. Um, so it's just this very kind of slow incremental process. So when we talk about, you know, hundreds of units in the pipeline, um, you know, there's a lot of steps that, that they need to jump through in order to um, be vertical, so to speak. And Jeanette, I didn't address naturally occurring affordable housing, which you did, and kind of the article was about that naturally occurring affordable housing. So we don't necessarily track our naturally occurring affordable housing, right? So when it exits, when it's no longer affordable, it's not necessarily that some alert is going up and that the city gets that notice and, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Sometimes it does happen that way. And there aren't necessarily special tools. There are some tools that we can use, that we, the same tools we use for new development. But naturally occurring affordable housing doesn't have any subsidi subsidies attached. So there is no reporting, right? These numbers I'm talking about are properties and units that have subsidies attached so we can track them. Thank you very much for that. All right, Lily, thank you again for being here. Thank um, you. As you're an activist for housing justice in the community, I have seen you at uh, rallies, at demonstrations, you're at city council meetings. Um, you're doing a lot of work with the people who are living outside 
at the moment and, and helping to keep that area as safe and clean as, as possible, you and your friends. Um, but I'm wondering, through that experience, um, what do you see as the biggest housing issue for policymakers to solve? Um, well, I would like to walk it back pre-Great Recession um, to address generational wealth and racial inequities that created this crisis in the first place. The reason that we're seeing these problems is because mainly the people who own homes are white, and that's because of direct redlining and racism that occurred during those times. I challenge anyone who owns a home pre-Great Recession to tell me that they spend 30% of their income on their mortgage. I don't know if anyone spends 30% of their income on their mortgage. And I think that if they did, we wouldn't be looking at the crisis that we're looking at right now. I think that's a, a huge amount of money when I know that there are people who are paying more for rent than, than others pay for mortgage, and it's rooted in racism. And, and Reno has a very deep and rich history of it when it comes to housing. And I think that we cannot have this conversation unless we um, address the racial roots of the racist roots of this uh, market. This is not an accident. This was a planned thing, and um, many of the people that are outside are black and brown. Um, and what we're seeing is the criminalization of these people when they were set up to fail. Um, and I think that that is the, where I would like to direct the conversation back at probably every time you talk to me, because I don't think that we can have one conversation without <laughs> having the other. Um, so I think that the biggest issue that I'm seeing is, um, as far as aid workers go, we we're told there are resources and that not directed how to get those resources. We we're told that there are um, issues with people living outside, assuming that those issues don't happen with people living inside. Plenty of people do drugs and have messy homes inside also, and we don't go to their houses and make sure that they're clean all the time and then send the police to remove them from their homes when their houses aren't clean and when they're doing drugs. And I think that that is, um, that is particularly egregious. Um, I know that I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a wealthy community. However, I've never um, lived in a home owned by my family. I had two working grandparents my entire life. I will probably never own a home. And my son may never own a home as well. Um, but I do know that living in that wealthy community in Washoe County and in Klein Village, that the amount of drugs and alcohol that were used inside homes and the amount of crimes happening inside of these multi-million dollar mansions were much, much further exacerbated than I see outside. I've seen more drugs inside mansions than I've seen on the side of the river, and I think it's time to talk about that. Yeah, you bring up a good point. Yeah, I love you. <laughs> I mean, just to reinforce what you're saying, and there, you know, we don't read about this every single day. We read about it in cities like Chicago and Baltimore and Boston. But, you know, if you, those of us who are homeowners in this audience, um, if your home was built um, in a certain period of time between the 30s and the 60s, if you go back and look at your CCNRs, my house, this applies to, um, it says specifically in there that non white people are not allowed in that development. So um, when we talk about, um, racism in, in this community and others that lead to these housing equities um, is very real. So thank you for bringing thank that you. up. Um, Garrett, thank you very much for being here. Um, I would really like your, um, your perspective um, a little bit on the broader landscape when it comes to housing development in Reno. Um, I think it has the most dis disproportionate effect on, on um, uh, the lowest of income people um, our neighbors in this community, but it's also being followed at other um, income levels, right? Uh, so yeah, if, if you could just kind of describe, talk about that broader landscape of, of um, housing development, and then with the Neon Line District in particular, there's talk about maybe 300 units will be included in that, maybe 3,000 housing units will be included in that. Um, can you talk about what types of housing we might see come to fruition um, in that district? So, so that's a long rambling question, but it tees you up. <laughs> sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. You know, on a personal level, my family's been here for 50 years, born and raised, so really appreciate being part of this. And on a professional level, representing um, Jacobs Entertainment, we heard about this and contacted you this week and said, please include us in this conversation. So thank you for having us. Let me try to break your question up in, uh, in a few parts. So on the income side, on the broad swath of incomes and the, um, the, the, the impacts, 
Um, I also pull a little, you know, a little data just to kind of understand what, what's happening out there. So I think Wendy hit it on the head. We're really dealing with availability and then affordability. Um, if you look at wages, to your question about income, um, average wages in Washoe County grew 9% in, in 2020. And in the last year, it's raised 30%. Um, so wages are growing in our community. Uh, the average wage in Washoe County now is over $28 uh, an hour. If you go out and look at TRIC, um, it's even higher than that. I, I just reached out to a local economist. I thought that would be helpful just to get um, some of the wage information. So I think back to the point, availability and affordability. Um, I think the availability side, as far as the higher income wage folks, um, it's just the availability is the issue, but I think we're all here to focus on the other point of affordability uh, with our non-workforce and low-wage households and how to stabilize that. On the uh, availability side, inventory is coming. In 2020, um, over 12,000 people, uh, excuse me, over 22,000 people moved to Washoe County and only 12,000 new units were constructed. So a big discrepancy of new units versus people moving in, and that's kind of a balanced out now, which is important. Uh, on the broader landscape, I can just speak for, um, I think, kind of many of developer in town. It comes down to really three pieces, just materials, land, and labor cost. Trying to make deals pencil. If it's uh, the affordable housing project for Dane, if it's a market rate project, if it's a workforce housing project, trying to make these deals pencil with land cost. We can all agree land costs have certainly shot up. Labor costs um, as well are extremely expensive. And materials. I've never heard the word lumber futures and since the last couple weeks or months that you actually have folks, developers, from affordable housing to workforce to market rate looking at what the cost of lumber is today, next week, next month, I know a handful of projects are actually gonna pull a building permit and get built next year because the lumber futures are finally stabilizing and you can get uh, these, these deals to, to pencil. Um, one example I can use is 301 State Street. Uh, this is a parcel that the city owned next to Bertha Miranda's. The city granted an economic development project to that developer. And developer said, I wanna pay fair market value for this property. The value appraised at a half million dollars for that property. City Council said, we'd like to see some workforce housing on that property. If we're gonna give this property to you at fair market value, we wanna make sure there's workforce housing 10%. So the appraiser, hired by the city, recalculated what that means and it dropped the value of the pro pro property to 160,000. So just 10% of workforce housing for a project was a 65% reduction in the price, so about $50,000 a unit. So I think trying to get affordable units on the, in the market, private developers or private landowners across our community are not gonna give a 65% discount when they sell their property to do affordable. So I think that means we need to hopefully up here kind of talk today about what the government can do philanthropic involvement and many of your organizations to kind of bridge that gap to make sure market rate workforce, but especially affordable, um, can, can pencil. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, I appreciate the question about Jacobs Entertainment. Uh, a couple things. One, when, Je when Jeff Jacobs came to town, a lot of people don't know this, um, he has been an owner um, of the Gold Dust West here in Reno also in Elko, also in, in Carson City for over 15 years. So he's been here for a while. He purchased the Sands and then had a vision of dynamic mixed use uh, entertainment district with two to 3,000 housing units, as you mentioned, uh, entertainment, amphitheater, um, retail, commercial, really have a dynamic um, in investment in downtown. And that was a result of looking at Reno's downtown action plan, which I think all the council members supported. But their number one goal of this community was focusing on, on downtown. So what he did from day one, and I'll just take a minute or two. To, I yeah. think you broke the question out. It was kind of a long question. Um, from day one, when Mr. Jacobs showed up, a lot of people don't know this, but he contributed $1.5 million cash to the Reno Housing Authority. There was a delta to finish the Willie J. Wynn apartments on Sutro senior affordable housing, 44 units, there was a delta of missing 1.5 million. So he 
wrote a check, said, I want to be part of this community right away. Let's move that development forward. In our district, and I say our district, I think this is this community's district, uh, Sarah's in Arms has 60 units, affordable housing in the middle of the district. That's not obviously going anywhere. Next to that facility is the courtyard, which is also subsidized housing, another 240 units. Right, so, yeah. that's, existing, that's existing housing. If, we could, if I could just get you to jump a little bit forward um, to kind of future looking, um, you know, what, what kind of housing is, could be in this district? And is Mr. Jacobs going to be building it? Is he just selling land to other housing developers? Um, so far, you know, we talk about the different tools that, that the city has to, to encourage affordable housing. They haven't quite yet. Maybe they will in the future been brought to bear. There's no requirement for that. So, um, you know, just briefly, if we could jump forward a little bit. Perfect. I'll, I'll, summer, I'll, I'll follow up here. Perfect. So, uh, jumping forward, uh, Jake, Mr. Jacobs purchased uh, the, 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 the Crest Inn, which was the number one calls for service in downtown Reno for domestic violence for crime, for prostitution. That's now been converted to 46 affordable units. So Renova Flats is affordable units right now per HUD standards. Going forward, Mr. Jacobs, any apartments that he builds will have 10% affordable housing included in that project. And that does not pencil for what he paid for the land, but we've always said it's been in some articles, some hasn't been included, that's part of the, the project. As far as other developers coming in to build other areas within it, probably be market rate, given the cost of the land and the development, but Mr. Jacobs has made sure to have an affordability component moving forward. Does he have plans to build any housing? Uh, he does. We're currently in for a tentative map on a condominium project on 2nd Street. That uh, he personally is, will be building. So 10% of those units will be affordable? That's the condominium project, so not, mm -hmm. not the for sale product won't. But any future um, apartments um, projects will have that okay. component. And we're already carving out uh, footprints around the area. I'm happy to share that with you uh, of where those potentially could go. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And I, I hear you in the audience also sometimes when we talk about economist data and, and numbers, they don't match with the lived reality and the lived experience. So. Could, I, could I interject about that number? Um, please, yeah. I do, I do believe that the median income probably is $28 an hour because we have a lot of city officials making upwards of $300,000 a year. And a lot of their campaign contributions are from developers like these gentlemen sitting up here. So I do believe that that probably is the number. We have a city manager that got a raise of $136,000 for one year of work. So I, I think that, yes, that probably is the number. And the people making the decisions are making almost a half a million dollars a year on the poor. And that is probably when you average it with the actual number that workers are getting, which is like $15 an hour, hopefully. But maybe, maybe that's correct. But also, if I could expand too on the lumber thing, there are many, many environmentally appropriate solutions to not using lumber at all, such as hempcrete, which is another legislative thing that should be happening, growing hemp for hempcrete and other sustainable uses of, um, and other sustainable ways to build are also really important. But um, I, again, it's really, it's really hard to hear the word affordable and hear that it's also affordable means 30% of your income. So I just would like to do yes. an experiment. Yes. Please raise your hand if you okay. own a home. Raise your hand if 30% of your income is your mortgage. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. I, we will have time for audience Q&A, so if we can try and keep, keep the discussion on the stage for now, but we will be getting to you. And um, Devin, I think that, that brings us to you. I think we, we've, we've already heard a little bit of the universe that you are working in as an elected leader and as, as, as a policy maker. As you are listening to um, all these various points of view and trying to solve a problem, um, how would you describe what people are experiencing and how would you describe um, how the council is trying to, to meet that? Yeah, I think it's an important question. Um, what you are seeing both in the audience and when you're outside of this room is we're in a crisis, right? We can agree or disagree on the cause of the crisis, the root cause, the sub causes, um, but people are hurting. Um, people are 
you know, they're in a position where life is, uh, has been made very difficult, not only by the pandemic, but by national factors that are, are largely out of their control. And so people are, um, they're desperate for solutions. So ultimately, I think the question that comes to us as council members, and one of my colleagues is in the audience, council member Dewar is here, thank you for being here, um, is, yeah, clap for sure. <laughs> council member Dewar is a tenacious advocate for uh, many of the issues that we're talking about today, and it's a privilege to serve with her. Um, I, I guess ultimately what I would say is that every day, uh, each council member, um, is asked questions that touch on all of these subjects. And each day uh, we are looking for solutions, we are uh, listening to folks with lived experience, we are uh, in the community, we are going to other communities to find out what they're doing that's right and working. We're reading um, and you know, there's just, there's no one size fits all approach that's gonna solve it. There's no one solution that everyone is gonna agree on. Uh, there's no uh, way that anyone can um, say that they have ownership of the way to fix it or what the path ahead is. I do think that uh, Lily was correct that our starting point ought to be an acknowledgement of the structural factors, both race and capitalism, that have created the conditions in which we operate. Um, and sometimes those become very academic uh, and we can get lost in the numbers and the AMI and the focus. For my part, I think if we focus on people uh, we'll find the best path forward. All right, thank you very much. Okay, why don't we, I'd like to um, go down the line here um, and ask a question, um, a quick question, well maybe it's not quick, but <laughs> to kind of set the stage of what you all think we're up against as a community. Um, so the question is, in your, drawing from all your own experiences in this realm, what do you think is the single biggest barrier to affordable housing? And we can start with you, Dan. Sure. And again, my reference point is tax credit affordable housing. Um, and we have had great experience with the city and city council. They uh, recently sold us a piece of property in downtown in the Neon Line District um, for 206 senior affordable apartments. Um, the city actually asked us to do some extremely low income units and they lowered the land price even more, which is right in line with what you were saying, Garrett. The land price is probably the biggest hurdle right now. And then impact fees are second. Uh, we're spending about $15,000 a unit, even if it's a small studio apartment, just in impact fees. City of Reno is the only city in the state that has created an affordable housing incentive and they basically waived the sewer fee, which is $7,000 of that fifteen. dollars if you provide affordable housing. The only city in the state that's done that. So uh, to me, it's fees, the cost of construction have gone ridiculous. And we build market rate and affordable, and the construction costs are the same. The only difference is you might have a, you know, more expensive appliances or a bigger clubhouse, but we're, we're building the same unit, basically. Um, so construction costs, impact fees, and land costs. And then the process, if we want to get into that, is flawed. <laughs> how we have to go through this year process. We have to apply in December for a project that we can't build for a year. Only one application date a year in the home fund round, which is ridiculous. So we miss projects. Um, Council Councilwoman Dewar, we had a project in her ward. We missed the cutoff for the home fund application, so we had to drop the project. 160 great senior units. So anyway, the process is flawed. It needs to be improved. And it's hard to get through change in the process. Mm -hmm. So process is probably the biggie. It is slow. As someone yep. who's watched uh, government at all levels for a yep. number of years. And I'm talking <laughs> about the financial process, not the construction approvals. Right. The construction approvals are fine. It's this finance process okay. to do a tax credit deal. Okay. Great. Thank you. And those finance processes are not created by the city. It's the home, home fund process, yes. It's a consortium of the cities and the county. And it's just been, it's been the same process for 30 years. It just mm -hmm. needs to be changed. You're going through the city, the county, and the state yes. to get to the financing yeah. that you need. The home consortium consists of the city of Reno, city of Sparks, and the county all working together to distribute federal grants for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But they only have one application date a year. So we lose, we could do another 500 units a year if that process was changed. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Christine, in your experience, what's the single biggest barrier? Yeah, I think that's, a, again, a really big question um, because, as Councilman Reese referenced, 
right, affordable housing is really different, right? We've talked a little bit about supportive housing. Transitional housing rise, to come out of rise and have a home, you need supportive housing that maybe has case services that comes alongside you so that you're set up for success. So you can transition into one of Dane's more affordable units where you may need less services, ideally to home ownership. The system is definitely not set up. But I would tell you what I think is the hardest part of affordable housing. Again, Councilman Reese nailed it. There is not one solution. Uh, we currently have a recommendation to the state that they invest $500 million in affordable housing. I wish I could tell you that I actually think that would solve all of our problems. It won't. So I would tell you, I think our biggest barrier to affordable housing and addressing affordable housing, and I live right here in Reno too, so I get to watch firsthand as well, is us. Actually, all of us in this room, in my opinion, are the barrier to affordable housing. I've been thinking about this a lot. Incredible partners at the state. You know, there's nobody's perfect, but I can tell you the city of Reno has done some amazing things. We have developers at the table. Staff, I get to work with staff, they're incredible for the people of this city, but I think it's all of us as a community, I think really need to ask ourselves, do we really want to solve affordable housing? Because I can tell you there are so many different ways. I watched Reno, Reno and the accessory dwelling unit conversation, right? That's an example. It's not an end all solution, but it's a piece. Right? Again, when we think of affordable housing and all these different pieces that need to come together for all the different income levels, our workers, those who may have disabling conditions on fixed income, right? those trying to transition into home ownership, it's really us, Jeanette, and Jeanette, I think, and I know that's a strange answer maybe, but if our community rises up and says we want to solve it, there's so many different ways we can do it, and I think we can. Yeah, no, I hear, I hear what you're saying. Um, I've watched, as someone who's covered uh, the, the city for a number of years, there used to be a slide, and I haven't seen it recently, and this will lead into your, your answer here, um, Devin. Uh, and it was basically like a jigsaw puzzle slide that um, when city staff in charge of working on the housing issue would put up, it was a, it was a puzzle and it had different, you know, affordable dwelling units on there, um, construction of affordable housing, shelter, there are lots of different pieces on that. And when affordable or when uh, accessory dwelling units or tiny homes, Grammy flats and people's yards came up, staff had worked a long time on a policy for that. And at that meeting, there was some very loud opposition from people who already own homes and are living in the neighborhoods that would have been allowed to build those. And, and it was stopped in its track. Um, so when you say that us, all of us here in this community have a role to play in this, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, OK, Councilman. Yeah, the answer is very similar, um, except I would phrase it in a coalitional politics way. I think that we as a community are at times very divided over a subject which I think is very, um, at its core, something we can all agree on, which is that everyone is entitled to um, safety and shelter and food and the resources necessary to um, be happy, healthy, and well. Um, and that's from all sides of the political aisle. Um, there is no um, doubt in my mind that fundamentally people want good things for other people. Uh, it's human nature, I think, to believe that people are, that, that housing to human right, for example, even if ultimately you get to it from a different perspective, and you can talk about the construction costs and the barriers through access and the you know, different kinds of structural racism that undergird the history of this country and still not get to a place where you're able to find a solution um, so when we are in council at times, we hear a lot of very honest, heartfelt pleas from people who talk about their lived experience. And then we get a call, usually a caller, because they don't come down, and the caller says, you know, I'm angry because there are people who are living in the alleyway near my house, right? And then there are people who say, I want to go to the park. And so you just have all this swirling emotion uh, around an issue which we, we have to just peel off in the ways that we can with the tools that we have. 
and separate out all of the, um, some of the politics of it, some of the um, ill will that people have towards other people. Um, and so if we, I think our, our colleagues think a lot about that because at the end of the day, again, we are living in a very uh, difficult time. I think it's a result of a lot of factors that all are, I hope, bending towards economic justice, uh, social justice, equality movements across the country and the globe. Um, I also think it is hard because we're not unique. I don't think Reno is this strange place that is disconnected from other places. Um, people are struggling everywhere. Um, in every part of the globe, there are people who have been um, uh, not been able to fully engage in, in civil society because of inequality, uh, wealth, income gaps that are widening, all of those things. But ultimately, it's about people, and coalition building, I think, is the way through it. Okay, thank you. And Wendy, from your work with people um, on this level, what is, what's the biggest barrier out there that, that we need to address? Well, I, I think out there, because again, as a, as a community, we've grown and the places to call home, there just isn't, they're not there. And I know building them upgrades everybody for openings, and I know we have a lot of things building in the, in the meantime, but like right now, when you're out there, that doesn't do any good for us. So I, I have to say there's two, the lack of availability on what's available and the wages that are paid for one family, it's just not, it's not enough. You know, but you, it's, it's, I think it's unfair to make a business go from like nine to twenty dollars an hour because then your business goes under. But the wages, some, somewhere we lost something in what how the wages don't match what everything else is like raised to, and I think there's like a big disconnect in there. Mm -hmm. That I think. Yeah, yep, yeah, I hear you. Thank you, Garrett. What do you think is the biggest barrier to affordable housing in this community? It's a tough act to follow. I think. Uh, <laughs> Many of, the, many of my responses have, have, been, um, have been made, but I know we might get into this a little bit later, but I think um, locational opportunities as well. I think it's fair to say every ward in our community should have affordable housing in it. And sometimes there's zoning barriers or other barriers. I mean, I was interesting, I was looking at Midtown um, prior to this meeting and there's a cap on density and height in Midtown. And you think that might be a great opportunity to have additional affordable housing, mixed-use opportunities. I think all the data reflects you don't want to put affordable housing in one location. You want to spread it out. You want it to be integrated with, with the community, with workforce housing, with market rate housing. So um, I, I love my urban planning degree. I, I, I love doing planning in addition to law. And I think we get together in panels like this and figure out where it should go and how it should go. The, the cost and economics will hopefully work itself out as we get out of this COVID and the supply chain comes back online. But I think sitting down with a, maybe even a map and working with groups like this and figuring out the best place and places and opportunities uh, would might be my suggestion. Yeah, I, I definitely want to hear some thought, more thoughts on, on zoning and how that has kind of stood in the way to building housing. When we talk about density and height in, in Midtown, um, you know, the restrictions on be, being able to put housing in different places. Um, is it time to get rid of single family zoning? You know, it's a question that I would like to hear some of your thoughts on uh, when we get to it. But um, Lily, I can see that you are bouncing in your seat. What do you see is the... <laughs> I'm sorry if my brains are splattered all over the auditorium right now. Um, the biggest barrier to affordable housing is greed. That is the biggest barrier to People should not be making money on taking other people's wages and calling it rent. That is the biggest barrier. You should not be able to have your only job should not be going to the mailbox and getting a check from someone who worked their ass off for 40 to 60 hours a week and then calling it work. That's not work. Hoarding of wealth is the biggest of the biggest barrier. We have people that I think that maybe if we did an experiment and we flipped it where everyone who does have a mortgage pays 30% of their income for one year towards the crisis, I think we would be looking at a different city almost overnight and it could be happen very quickly. I think that people are not ready to both in the way of of, um, I, I see it all the time with um, anti-racism. People are not willing to sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed to solve the problem. People want to have their cake and eat it too. We have poor people helping poorer people, and then people at the top telling us how to do it effectively. 
that have never helped any of these people the way that other folks do. We are going to our jobs and then going to the river and then going to the motels. We're not even accounting for people that are living in Siegel Suites, which is not stability. That is not, that is still housing insecurity. We're not seeing the people up top. We have never seen anyone trickle down. It's never trickled down and we're still doing this trickle down economy kind of thing. This guy, sorry, he doesn't care what the biggest barrier to affordable housing is. He never will, it's not his job. His job is to represent a corporation that is there to make money on other people. That's, not, that's what his job is. Like, that's just not, it's, not, it's not fair to sit here and act as if there is this difficult um, solution. The, the difficulty relies in the, the wealthy's inability to share. What? Yeah, and that is everywhere. You're right. That is everywhere. Yeah, that it's and it and at one point, as we've heard before, the meek will inherit the earth. People will stop being polite about this. People will find the people will finally get so sick of this that they will do something about it. And it's not gonna be something that everyone that is palatable for everyone. And it's happened historically, time and time again, and it's getting ready to happen now. So either build faster or empty your pockets. I do, I do want to um, keep this conversation respectful, but I would like to hear, Dane and Garrett, what your reaction, how do, what is your response when you hear Lily talk about this, um, what she sees as, and what a lot of people, I think, in, in the audience and the community see as we have people living in very difficult conditions and then we have people that are earning a profit in many ways off of some of those conditions. Um, what's, you know, trying to keep this again, trying to keep it a little less emotional maybe, um, but what, what's your response when you, when you hear her talk about that? Um, a little bit new for me to hear something like that, to be honest with you. I'm sure. Yeah, and I do affordable housing, that's what I do. And I do make a profit. I don't make the profit that I would on a market rate deal. Um, and we're providing 500 affordable housing units a year through government subsidy. That's about all the, the money is there to do. So I understand what you're saying, and I, I agree. I mean, it's, it, we're, it's not just us. It's pretty much everywhere, um, every city, right, dealing with the same issue. So I, I totally hear you and understand what you're saying, and I feel for you. I feel for it. I mean, what did you I, make this year, sir? Um, a good living, more than the $28 an hour, but not millions. You know, what, what, was your, what was your take home for the year? Uh, what are you putting on your tax taxes? Probably in the low twos. Oh, okay. So. You couldn't have spared any of that? If I did only market rate housing, I would have made a lot more, and I could have spared more. Mm -hmm. But I chose to do affordable housing too. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, Garrett, would you, since you were pointed out in, in those comments, would you like to say anything in response? Yeah, I would. I guess just personally, um, it's nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, um, I'm at, I, if we're going to get a personal here, you know, I, um, you know, I grew up in the apartments behind Reno High School. Mm -hmm. The single mom, you know. That's worse. And, may, may, I, may, I, may I finish? A single mom. Um, she worked a couple jobs. I worked at PetSmart, washing dogs, in between baseball practice and going to school. And no, it wasn't a, a silver spoon. And I love this community. And I feel like at this point in my life, I can try to represent folks who also love and want to invest in this community. And I think sometimes we all talk over each other of what we're doing for this community, because I could probably list myself and my family, everything we've done. So my clients have written very, very big checks to help different causes that may not be your cause, and we should probably talk about that, but other causes in this community. And so I think probably the problem here and the barrier maybe is this kind of confusion and um, dysfunction of we all are in our little worlds and our different bubbles, and finally today, all of our bubbles are starting to come together. And from the politics to your cause, to your cause, all of our causes. And so I think more opportunities like this publicly, privately, figuring out how we get more folks down to the river, figuring out how we make deals pencil, figuring what policies in the downtown action plan and the master plan should be amended in order to open up the barriers. 
So I look forward to getting your contact information and having coffee next week and figuring out you know, what else I can do personally or some of my clients can do to help your cause. And that, yeah, that brings us to what I, kind of the next, the next question here is, as we do, we have very different experiences and, and jobs on this, on this panel. And I, I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about what, bar what barriers there are to communication and collaboration. I mean, is that something that, that you all have experienced? Um, and how do, we, how do we kind of bridge that? Wendy, do you have? Well, I think like as far as like everybody who's like completely opposite on like our goal or our beliefs, even though we all want it, we all agree we want more housing here. Like I, like to put it straight, I think we all need to leave our social status, our political beliefs, our religion, and our like like per, like assumptions about everybody that we're talking to at the door when we come in and have these meetings in general. Because like I can point out like this, it's okay, they're your brothers. So this that's your community. We're all in the same goal and we just have to like swallow that pride pill because it's, it's bullshit and you put that away and then everybody's, you know, you take all that big coat off and then everybody's just like humans all on the same page realizing that there are all these other humans that don't have homes are still, they're still family and they're still humans just like us. It's one paycheck away. Anybody in here can be out there. And if we, if we just put all that out and just work on the problem instead of like the, the blah, blah, blah around the problem, I think we'd get further, honestly. <laughs> when do you love rise? Okay. I'm just saying, like, because it's just like that everybody's so hung up on it. It's like you come in, it's like, oh, well, I see that you believe this. Oh, I see you're this political party. We already have that, like, angst about everybody that we're talking to. And if that was all put away, I think there'd be so much more time mm -hmm. and less drama to figure it out. And some nuts and bolts conversation, yeah. I can say um, when we're trying to do an affordable housing project, we often get neighborhood opposition. It gets sued. The projects get stopped. It happened a lot to us last year. Um, at the same time, there was a market rate project going through the approval process, no opposition. But because we we're doing affordable family housing, we got sued. Mm -hmm. Cost us an extra year, hundreds of thousand dollars in legal bills. So talking about the community as a whole, when you have people that just perceive affordable housing as dangerous or whatever, we got to, you know, the education process, but it doesn't matter. It's not my backyard. We don't want the ADA units, right? People say that because we don't want people in my backyard or whatever. But quite literally in that case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it yeah. is challenging. Um, and there's a lot of challenges, but that's, that's a big mm -hmm. one. And it's just regular Reno people that yeah. oppose affordable housing. Christine, you do work all over the state. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about some of these barriers to communication? And maybe a little bit about, uh, about that, that stigma that we still hear when you say the term affordable housing and, and uh, you know, people who have homes now come out in droves to <laughs> quite literally oppose that, that housing. Yeah, and I think, again, this kind of comes back. You know, the reason I'm here sitting up here today is because uh, the Housing Coalition and then definitely myself, I'm here for solutions. We are in crisis, and we can dwell on our crisis, and it's for lots of different things. But I'm here to tell you there are solutions. And as we think about communication, the not in my backyard, if you drive by an affordable unit that Dane builds, they're gorgeous, gorgeous homes that any of us would love to live in. You know, and so when we think about some of these that are built, and again, I'm talking about those with federal subsidies, you know, they have more requirements even than some of just private sector developments that go up. There is definitely a stigma across the state. I would say the conversations we're having here in Reno are in other places for different reasons, right? If I talk about Nevada, Southern Nevada has its challenges in, in different ways though, but we're having the same conversations. Rural Nevada. Right? You think you could drive two hours and find something more affordable, but there's other challenges that actually, they're also struggling with affordable housing. And, but what's really important is to have the conversation, to communicate, to know each other and know where we're coming from. And I love that, Wendy, putting aside, I would say housing is not partisan, right? It doesn't matter what your political leanings are. Housing impacts all of us. But the communications and collaboration, the misperceptions of affordable housing are certainly there. And it's really confusing. We say 30% AMI, 50% AMI, you know, and, and I do say, hey, I hear you. You want to build it and be done with it. But guess what? Some people actually just need some help with services and that's not going to end. 
But there's no government that's going to solve it. I don't actually believe that government should nor can solve affordable housing. That's why, again, it's all of us in the room coming together with our private sector partners, mission-driven developers, to get it done. It's interesting to hear you say that because I have seen a lot of um, work on the national level that says, you know, federal resources need to be brought to bear here, that, you know, the private market is not meeting this need. Local governments are kind of ill-equipped to do it, so maybe... Um, and that, that kind of brings us in, because I do want to get to audience questions, so I'm going to ask one last question, um, kind of, Mary, go around here, and, and that is to focus on, uh, get our conversation <laughs> turned towards what are the, the solutions. And Lily, I do, real quick, I do want to kind of apologize. I wasn't trying to imply that you were being disrespectful at all. I was just trying to keep the conversation. That's fine. Maybe you know. less for certain people than others. Well, <laughs> <laughs> But as we, as we turn now to kind of our closing question for the panel discussion so we can get to um, the audience questions, what are the immediate solutions we as a community can do to help those experiencing homelessness or the threat of homelessness and what long-term solutions should be implemented now? So why don't, why don't we start, Lily, what are your thoughts on that question? Um, is it possible to rewind just a second to... Um tap on to Christine's point yes. really quickly. I do think that there are a couple of governmental things that I actually have really robust conversations with Councilman Reese and some others about, um, which one of them would be repealing Dylan's rule for rent, rental, rent control, because we're seeing quite a bit of rent gouging. Mm -hmm. Another would be an impact fee that goes towards a different kind of affordable housing, where right now we have, uh, I believe, a door fee that goes towards parks and rec, and it would be nice for those to go to other services. And then another, um, it is absolutely a nonpartisan issue, because as we saw this session, we had Democratic real estate agents voting down affordable housing bills, so that's kind of the thing that I, I do agree that it's completely nonpartisan. It is about your, you know, your career. We have a part-time legislature, legislature. They have to have jobs. Some of those jobs are in direct conflict with um, the, the good of their constituents. So, that was the only thing I wanted to say about, um, about that as far as government goes. Um, and then you're asking what can we as a community do for homelessness? Mm -hmm. um, we could stop calling the police on them. That would be very helpful. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that we're seeing, and I know I was out of town yesterday, and we have a, like a network of, of folks working with people that were being swept behind UNR. We have somebody awaiting housing into a rehab facility that's being swept up again. We have someone, you know, we have people dying. <laughs> and we have a, a huge amount of money. And um, as we saw, we had a consultant come, um, John DeCarmine from Grace. And he is um, perhaps one of the people that is closest to solving one of these issues um, in Gainesville, Florida. And he said he's never seen money thrown at this issue like he has in Reno. And that means that somebody is making money somewhere. We uh, came up with the figure that, uh, I'm sorry, I did not come up with the figure. The figure was set on the record that it was $55,000 per bed um, would have been the cost of um, CARES Campus. And I would challenge that handing, handing 700 people $55,000 would have uh, greatly alleviated the issue that we're seeing right now. So um, we, I think that it really comes down to everyone needs money. Not everyone needs a voucher. Not everyone needs a rehab. People need cash. That is, a, it's been studied that that is the quickest way to help someone that is homeless give people cash. They spend it on whatever. It's not your, it's not your problem. Um, so I think we need more folks that are at the top that have the resources getting down and doing the work. I see a lot of people that are very generous and it's so nice that you'll leave something on your porch or whatever for us to come and pick it up. We have to understand that there are people that are really really using the running on fumes to deliver these resources to other folks and we need other people with boots on the ground right now there's a river cleanup happening led by um the river stewards with, and um, beverly harry and we did that also last week and a lot of the a lot of the waste that we're seeing is excess waste it's not waste from people who are unhoused it's kitchen sinks it's racing tires it's it's waste that is not it is not created the way that people think it is, and if they were down there to see it, then we would all understand. We have to put ourselves in these other people's um, shoes. And I did see some of the folks at the redevelopment agency meeting um, 
right before the cleanup, they did show up to the cleanup. And I think that it changed their perspective of what, what the problem actually is. And this water, protecting the water and protecting the land is, is paramount for everyone. And there are indigenous solutions that should be indigenous led for this crisis. We should, I mean, I'm, I feel out of turn not having someone you know, from that community here anyway because they should be the people that are making these decisions and, and helping us bridge the gap because we do have an environmental crisis, we have a humanitarian crisis, and we have to have everyone um, you know, coming together to figure out what it is because in, a, in five years or 10 years, we're gonna have a conversation or a panel talking about why can't we have clean water for these communities? How do we all get clean water? What do you think about the water rations? And, um, and I don't want to be having that discussion mm -hmm. in, the, in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much for your thoughts on that. Did you want to go next, Devin? Um, I, I just wanted to add that one of the communities that I think has been maybe overlooked is the faith-based community and the non-governmental organizations and nonprofits, right? So yes, there's government solutions to parts of it. There are private individuals doing work. There's the mutual aid society groups. Um, but, you know, we have F Father Duarte's here. We have, I think, someone from our uh, Lutheran community. There are other folks who are uh, also doing the work, and so I just didn't want to exclude them from being part of that solution. Um, your question, though, was really uh, directly about what are the things we can do and do now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, by the, a confluence of events related to the pandemic, <coughs> Uh, the city of Reno has received a lot of money over the last couple of years. Um, so the first part of that ended up being related to the CARES Act. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we moved very quickly to stand up the new Community Assistance Center. The next wave of money is the ARPA funds. And so the city of Reno will uh, receive in the neighborhood of $50 million. There's lots of red tape about how it can be sent, on what, in what manner, and over what period of time. But the community conversations like this and the ones that the state engaged in kind of on a listening tour are part of that discussion right there. How do we spend those dollars? And my absolute belief is that a large portion of that, maybe all of it, I, I don't know, will be spent on addressing housing needs. And again, you know, housing um, is one issue. Uh, homelessness is another. They're related, but not always directing the same solutions at them. Uh, and so I think that you know, money is not going to fix everything, but certainly I think it's going to be part of the conversation. One very, very brief departure. Um, the city jumped very quickly when the pandemic began to marshal resources to expand the shelter. And I'm wondering how and if that same quick response, marshalling of resources could be put towards actual housing for individuals. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the goal is that the city of Reno, which perhaps, and we can look at the historical origins of it, never should have been involved in sheltering issues, right? There are some legal and state laws about who is responsible for that and who should pay for it. Um, but they were they, for the last 25 years. And I grew up in St. Vincent's downtown working in that community. And when it moved to the CAC, uh, it beset a whole range of things that have historically uh, channeled the energy of the city in a different direction. And so my response is now having moved away from the sheltering piece of this discussion, that the city's sort of laser-like focus, I hope, and, and I know my colleague, Councilmember Dewar, and I have talked about this before, will be on housing. Now, and Lily hates it when I say it, but it's true. Um, governments don't move fast. No, 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 um, no. I know. I, 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 I know, but not everyone gets to hear the conversations we've had. Um, and 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 the truth is, is that um, I might want to move very fast, right? I, I individually and personally might want to um, be opening up the Record Street facility, for example. Yay. But the yeah, um, the the. The, the, but, the, but again, it's not just me. I, I don't get to make all the cheer decisions, right? It is a, um, a, a collaborative process where I have you know, six other colleagues, and then the county has colleagues as well. You're okay. This happens. We're all human beings. Um, I thought I 
much. Maybe it's like I'm, I'm getting to an amazing point yeah. in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think so. Very inspirational. Oh, yeah. I even yeah. tried yeah. to so not disturb on. I'm so sorry, You're Councilman. No problem. I, I, no problem. I, I guess ultimately, um, <laughs> it's not that I don't want to move faster, but you know, lawyers move very slowly. Finance departments move very slowly. So we push them as fast as we can within the confines of you know, our own resources and staffing issues. I do think that uh, we are making, and you will see after the first of the year, uh, some fairly significant announcements about where this community is headed from the city of Reno's perspective only into the housing area. I don't wanna you know, share those with you because it's uh, really not fully baked, but um, we have opportunities the goal is to go out and execute on those opportunities. And, and because we are not focusing on the sheltering piece anymore, our focus will be on uh, housing. And that's housing at all ranges, right? There are folks who cannot afford I mean, they, zero dollars of income, right? There are folks, um, and so that's why we look at different kinds of things like the village on Sage Street and the Hope's Tiny Homes Village and um, different kinds of opportunities. But again, all due speed that we can, I'm ready. All right, thank you very much. Okay, um, let's get to some audience questions here. Um, if you want to raise your hands well, and will be Rocio, oh, we. All right. <laughs> mic check, mic check. I almost feel like we need to draw straws with you, but. I wanted to remind everyone, please be mindful of the time that you spend on the mic. We do want to get to as many questions as we can. And again, just a reminder, please be respectful to everyone in the room. Um, and I am going to pass it all along to the first person. While I do that, if you all can please scoot in towards the middle. We do have folks on the side that would love to have a seat, if you'd be so kind as to let them have one. Um, but we'll go ahead and try I feel like you. this is the brutal part. Um, or it has potential. Um, hi, everyone. So um, basically what my question is, is when you asked about what the main barrier is to uh, not finding a solution to affordable housing in Reno. And of course, I can't speak for anyone else, but given I am low income housing, literally, uh, because I only make $800 a month, uh, my question is as a panel that was set up for today, why is there? Uh, no on house people or low income people on this panel because they are going to be the ones that explicitly know what a barrier to not finding housing is. So why is that the case? Why is it everyone up there has a home or owns a home? And, I, and I know I know Wendy and Willie yeah. And so I know they are the two closest uh, to what I'm asking, but again, why is there someone that isn't currently on house up there right now, or someone that is extremely low income, like myself up there, to actually say uh, from experience what those barriers are? Yeah, I appreciate your perspective, and I would love to get your contact information because if we have that, another panel. Um, I will say as someone who helped um, put this panel together, sometimes it can be difficult to get speakers from all um, levels. But, you know, Wendy, you please tell I, I was outside for 10 years. I've only been inside for four. And, and I'm, I'm like, I've gone through every channel, and I'm like, by the graces of Ray, Rise, am I able to pay? But... I am the biggest person because like some of the, the, the like our grandma, like say, say my friend's grandma was in one of those motels that was torn down and she's on that, you know, 741 a month. Where is she going to go? Where is she, where, she can't do the, like, I got your back. I'm totally like, I, I'm representing for that because I was out there. I get it. I'm, I still identify as being out there. Let's get more though. Yeah. Can I answer that too? Yes. Bill, we, we've far. tried to do that. And when I was asked to be on it, I asked if we could find someone else. Unfortunately, and Wendy was the person that I suggested because I know she's the closest person. There are two, two factors. Number one, I don't want to be in a space to re-traumatize someone because I'm triggered as fuck right now. And I'm not even sleeping outside and I'm like hot, you know? Number two, they're being swept at such a rapid rate we can't keep, we wouldn't yeah. have been able to find them. <laughs> Thank you. 
So how are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Tony. I'm familiar with Lily and Wendy, very familiar with them. Um, I've had the fortunate pleasure to work with Wendy when I worked at RISE, and I'm working with Lily, helping them um, with our impromptu protests and stuff. But um, I have like a three-part question for the panel. So one is, um, I just looked up the Renova Flats pricing. It's 250 square feet for anywhere between 1,100 and 1,200 a month <laughs> with no kitchen. It's a renovated motel room. How is that affordable for seniors? And two, um, what plans are there for the castaway in 7-Eleven motels? I live a block away from them, and my heart broke when I seen a lot of these seniors who relied on them being forced out the only home they know of and can afford because there is no affordable housing for seniors and the disabled, those who rely on Social Security. And three, um, I've lived here roughly 20 years, and the old Sundowner building has been vacant for just, I don't even know how long before that. So why can't that be turned into affordable apartments? Yeah. Garrett, do you want to address the question about the castaway in the 7-Eleven? Sure, I appreciate the question. Um, uh, castaway and 7-Eleven, yeah, those, those tenants have been um, re relocated. Um, the, to the I'd like, where? No, I'd like to, <laughs> let me, let me, so let me address this. Um, we have a regional housing manager, Kelly Wilson, and I think many, she, of you, many of you know her. She's two, rows behind, she's two rows behind you, sir, and be happy to, she can meet with, she can meet with you. Um, she's relocated successfully, you know, close to 400 uh, tenants um, with, with cash, um, with um, first and last month's rent, with furniture, with presents for their kids, um, moved them all around uh, this area and upgraded them, uh, we would say, in their living situation. I think we've been very, very sensitive. Um, Kelly Wilson, I, I think, is a person, if you haven't met, you should met. She cares. She has every tenant. They have her cell phone number um, that she can reach out at, at any time. And so I think we have been very sensitive and spent you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in those relocations to, to, to make it right. I can also say, you know, on the taking a step back from kind of the personal Jacobs thing, but back to the bigger discussion. You know, there's this word that I found um, in some of the planning research I've done. It's called high opportunity neighborhoods. And the idea is not to have housing, low income housing, all in the same area. You want that spread out throughout the city, throughout the wards. And I can say where people live, especially where children grow up, is critical to the long-term well-being, including life expectancy, health, and income. So there is an argument or a position that having that saturation of those low-income units in a three or four acre area, three or four block area, versus trying to spread it out and having these discussions about how we can get density bonuses, additional um, uh, units and places, having all of us support projects, right? If Dane has an, afford if Dane has an a, a affordable housing project, all of us should be standing in front of the city council and supporting it to kind of counteract some of the negativity from the neighbors that we'll hear. Even market rate housing, we all know that the more availability of units will help with affordability. I've stood up there at council on my own many times advocating for an apartment complex in a ward that might not be downtown and it's packed the room saying, we don't want this here. I would love you to be standing up there saying, no, we need to have more density in this area. We need to have an affordable housing uh, component in this area. So saturating it all one place and trying to spread it out, again, is my, my goal that hopefully empty all of us units. can work on have, moving have, forward. Kevin addressed the fact that there's empty units, okay, with people not in them at all. He's asking about the empty units. Yeah, it was a two-part question. I don't know, Devin or Dane, do you have any thoughts about the Sundowner or some of these other um, underused casino towers? I mean, UNR, when their dorm blew up, you know, Circus Circus used their tower for housing. There's been some examples of quick turnaround housing. Um, how can we get more of that? Yeah, I'll say a couple things. One is that the city does not own any housing. We, we, it is all done through Reno Housing Authority. Um, during the pandemic, the city, of course, moved very quickly to open the event center as some sheltering space. Um, but the Sundowner, uh, the Sands Tower that's going through innovation, a lot of these, I, it's, it, in my mind, it's fool's gold because I don't know what the 
um, condition of them is. Many of these places are, um, have been long vacant. Their owners don't know who they are. We've talked about as a city whether we need to have vacancy taxes, right, um, that would tax owners for leaving things out of you know, circulation. Obviously, the Sundowner was never intended as housing. It is you know, motel stock. Um, and I, I just haven't been in it for a long time. My guess is, is most of those buildings, whether it's that or the Ramada Inn, I mean, the city of Reno has explored whether or not we could go out and purchase a motel. Um, and we, we explored that when the CARES money came. It was not something that we could do legally. I think we're, we're waiting until January to talk about some of the ideas mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. about those kind of properties. So stay tuned. There, there has been a lot of success across the country, California in particular, um, of government agencies buying some of these hotels and motels and refurbishing them into housing pretty quickly. So it's a good, why don't we go to Can someone on this? Can I speak to that really quick? A yeah. lot of that happened by people occupying those buildings and protesting outside of them first. Mm -hmm. So I just hope that the city has, is aware of that if that occurs. Okay, That's great. how that happens. Thank you. Maybe someone from the side of the room? <laughs> And so, and, uh, and there's nothing in the books that prevents uh, a, a landlord from, you know, from, you know, like not doing that, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, this whole situation is going to be exacerbated if we can't even control the, the increases that are occurring. Thank you for sharing that experience. Rent control is certainly an important topic. It's we been. Don't have that. You're right. We, we don't at the city, and the reason why is because the legislature has not granted that authority to us. So yes. our lawyers have said, City of Reno, you cannot on your own go out and do that, even if we wanted to. I don't know that we would. I have some academic debate about it. Um, but the, the coming up with the policies, okay? What she's saying right there, you know, is... is That's not policy. true, and so I will talk... If you want to talk to me about it later rather than yelling, I was having a conversation with this woman. Um, our mayor has taken the lead on many of those issues, and again, I think it is incumbent upon us to approach the legislature and see where they might be on the question. It, it's not going to happen fast. One of my colleagues, Councilmember Dewar, is looking at whether we can use anti-gouging legislation to address that issue and it's something we're exploring. So um, again, I, I wish it were as simple as saying, hey, we're just going to do rent control. We don't have that power at the city of Reno, even if we the wanted it. Understand, understand. Megan, were you? Um, yes, my name is Megan Archambault. I'm the director of Reno Sparks Mutual Aid. Um, I would like to ask Garrett a question here. Um, you had mentioned that Renova Flats was an affordable unit. Um, in an RGJ article on 10-25-2018, um, it was marketed that Renova Flats is the first market rate housing project in Reno for Jacobs. Currently it has a $40 application fee and a $150 admin fee. Um, last known rent on there was $1,000, but your website isn't even working to request um, current rates. So. I think it's kind of odd that you're up here telling us that Jacobs has already invested in affordable housing when Renova Flats wasn't initially presented in that manner. Um, to say that Jacobs is a resident of Reno is to say that I own, uh, that I'm a resident of Ohio any longer because I still have $20 in an old savings account my grandmother gave me in high school. Um, I just, I want to see when you're up there answering this question of we have a condo project that's going to be for sale, I noticed you didn't give any specifics on any of the affordable housing that Jacobs will build. And the second part of this question would be, seeing as Jacobs isn't answering this question, is there anything that the city can do specifically 
in terms of new development to make some kind of regulation where those units have to be in place, built and or leasing. So if we're gonna knock down 100, that 100 have to be replaced and leasing before those 100 could be demolished. Because right now we're seeing net losses being told there's gonna to be a net gain in two to three years, and that does not help the people who are being violently swept week after week. And Lily's right, a lot of us, like myself, volunteers with Reno Sparks Mutual Aid, we're doing this out of our own pockets. I haven't worked for a year. I've been living on savings, and I'm tapped out. We're, poor people are helping poor people and we're seeing dollars and figures getting thrown around. Okay. And, you know, I Thank appreciate you for the that. man from Jacobs talking about his working class background. I have a working class background, too. I could never do what you do, sir. Thank you for that, that question. Do you want to be a little more specific about the housing? I know Renova Flats is, is um, at the median rate for studio apartments. It's above that. Um, any, any more specifics that you can give in terms of what might actually come about in terms of affordable housing in the neon line district yeah thank you for the question uh again you know this week we um heard about this panel and tried uh rapidly to get on it so i hope that goes a long way to for you to understand we want to be part of the conversation uh, and be here and be here going forward as far as renova flats um i, I confirmed again this morning that it's not subsidized housing it's market rate, but the rents uh, meet the HUD guidelines. Uh, that's my understanding. I read the HUD guidelines. It does meet that. So that was, that was my point. Sorry if I um, caused any confusion about it being subsidized, but the rents do meet, do meet the HUD standards. Okay. As, far as, moving as far as moving forward, um, let me say this. As you've heard up here, costs, land costs, labor, et cetera. Jacobs paid fair market value for every, pro every property in that area. As you heard earlier, to make an affordable housing pencil project, you need a 65% discount. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean we don't have any affordable housing in it, is we have to plan the whole district in order to figure out how you build the subsidized housing while you, affordable housing, while you move forward with the bulk of the project. So I'm still saying here today, two to 3,000 units, mixed use, entertainment, um, you know, Sparks has a great amphitheater in its downtown, Reno should as well, but we absolutely know, and I made this point at the at when our development agreement was approved the other day, that the next time we come forward with a vision, it absolutely will include, when we start talking about tax increment financing and other things of that standpoint, how we will make workforce housing and affordable housing pencil. So it's okay, at the top of our list. We're getting very close to the end. I do want to just say real quick that the invitation was extended to Jacobs well more than a month ago. Um, so I appreciate you um, jumping up here this last week to be a part of the panel. But just I just want to say that his, he was. Um, but uh, could, you, could you address real quick this question of when housing is demolished, why or how or should the city have a requirement to replace that housing? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer why historically we haven't. Um, I don't know if it's a matter of this whole Dillon's rule versus home rule state stop. Uh, I can certainly look into it. What I do know is that um, inclusionary housing is um, another part of that toolbox, and it may be the answer to that. And so whether or not we pursue those things is really a council direction and decision. Um, but there, I, I, I don't believe in state law there's any requirement that when a unit is torn down or removed from housing stock, that more would replace it. The other thing is, is the motels were never intended as housing, I don't think, right? But and they so served that they, way. They absolutely have served that and, 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 and continue to do so. If you look across the, even the 4th Street corridor, um, they do serve that capacity. Um, but I, they weren't built or designed for that, so I don't know what the design standards would be. Um, there are some vacancy taxes that are related to that. These concepts are related. I don't think they're disjointed from one another. Do, can we expect that a, a more robust conversation and action will happen on these questions from council in the next couple Without months? a doubt. Not only that, but some of those conversations will happen um, with the Mutual Aid Society. Megan Arbuchambeau and I are going to organize something after the first of the year, which would be 
uh, very much focused on that. Councilmember Dewar has requested town hall style meetings where people could ask questions because again, in a business meeting, which is what city council meetings end up becoming, there's no opportunity for interaction. You can't ask a question and I provide an answer, and then we go Sorry. to, it doesn't happen. Right, okay. We are going to close with one last question from this gentleman here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have such good questions. Very, very quickly. <laughs> I, I have no, no, just let me quickly give the question. You asked me to be brief. Okay, I will be brief. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell Wendy that uh, the handout that I sent, which was uh, part of my uh, statement I made on October 13th at council, I removed the word that you uh, objected to. Thank you. I very um, much no one's that. ever described my home with that word, and I apologize for describing your home with that Thank word. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, the fellow who wrote this book, Shane Phillips. I uh, was now working for Regenesis Rena. My name is Gordon Gossage. Simple question. Are you willing to have a conversation with Shane and myself, one-on-one, -on -one, each of you? Um, if not, please tell me that uh, you can't. And what Shane is, he's at the UCLA Lewis Center of Housing, and he believes there are three S's for affordable housing. Gordon, supply, we see each other all subsidy. the time, and you know how to reach me. Can we ask the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I totally so thank get you it, very much. You call me anytime, and we'll hang out. Yeah, thank but you. can we get the That's last just, question? Yeah, just here? one last question. Yeah. From Hello. Good job, okay. Um I actually have um, a question for Dane and then a question for Devin. Uh, we know that you received $24 million to build an affordable housing unit for seniors. My question to you is, when you get either big subsidies or uh, whatever tax rebates for providing low-income housing, how long are you contractually obligated to provide low-income housing for? And what is the normal course of action for when that contract is dissolved in terms of continuing to provide low-income housing after the contract is dissolved? My question for Devin is, I was at the sweep yesterday where hundreds of people were swept behind UNR. I talked to the police officers and I talked to the clean and safe team. Both of them said that that was a directive from the city of Reno. We looked up on the county website how many beds were available, both at CARES and at our place. That number was 17. There was five beds available at our place. There were more than five women that I saw while we were having that conversation. There were literally hundreds of people swept. We know that that is illegal under Martin versus Boise and that it is against our eighth constitutional rights. So my question is, how are you still ordering sweeps? Stop the sweeps. That's the number one thing that the government can be doing. Stop the sweeps. That's it. It is easy. It is simple. There's no reason that you should still be commanding sweeps from happening. There were pregnant women. There were women that had severe mental illness in a state of psychosis that didn't even realize that their possessions were being thrown in the garbage. So before you come up here and say how good that the city of Reno is doing, please question, why are you letting people freeze to death by continuing the sweeps? Thank you. So the answer on the affordability component so that I can get to your second question is it's dependent on the product. It's 20 or 30 years that they're locked into affordability, right? The second question, and I won't be able to give you as nuanced an answer that you deserve given the time constraints, is that I don't think it's good for pregnant women to sleep on railroad tracks. And that's the bottom line. Um, and so I understand. I, I'm, trying to give, I, I, I'm trying to give you... Um, yeah, an answer, illegal. and and I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, right? Um, understand that You're we operate in the Boise v. Martin arena. We comply with it to the best of our ability, I believe. If you think we haven't, make a, reach out to me, and we'll sit down and talk about it. Um, so I, I know it's not an answer that you will accept, but I'm trying to tell you, um, I believe that we have built capacity. Even this last week, the county opened up another 300, um, essentially, beds in the adjacent facility. So our capacity, and, and I think about it this way, our capacity pre the CARES camp, which was somewhere around 325 persons, our capacity region-wide now is approaching 1,000. 
So while it's not the answer you want, yeah, it is getting you people just outside. Stop the until those I, are I understand that that's Can you what tell you. Tell us right now that you will stop the sweeps until there is a place for the people to go. There is, there the is a place for facility. them to go currently. There is not. There is. No, there the was CARES 17 campus. beds available in 100 people's spot. That is what was available. That is what the Clean and Safe team and the police said. Okay. Open up Again, Record Street appreciate. while we figure it yeah, out. Open Record Street instead of going on Christmas vacation for the next month. Open Record Street. That's 300 beds right there. Turkey, ready to Appreciate tomorrow. your advocacy. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. There's so at least 430 unhoused that are still kind of full with only 300 more beds coming. So. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. We are, we are going to wrap up this conversation for this particular time period, but I have great faith that this, this conversation is going to continue as we go on. Um, so I really appreciate all of you.